Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, a very warm welcome to our service of divine worship on this, the Lord's Day. Uh, we also extend warm fellowship greetings to those who will be joining in the streamed version uh, of our service, and especially to those at John Knox Church in Townsville. I direct your attention now to the order of service that you have, and we join together in worshipping our Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvellous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made his salvation known and revealed his righteousness to the nations. He has remembered his love and his faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. We sing as our doxology part of the hymn, the church's one foundation is Jesus Christ the Lord. We join together now in our prayer of adoration. Let us all pray. Almighty God, help us at the start of another Lord's Day to enter your place where there is now no darkness. Disperse the shadows that hide your glory from us and illumine our souls with the radiance of your truth and love through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now we'll sing again to God's praise in the hymn uh, with harps and vials.
Well, that certainly got our vocal cords going this morning, didn't it? And a wonderful hymn of praise. We come before God now in our prayer of confession and of supplication. Let us all pray. A God in whom we trust and who is ever to be found by those who seek you, we acknowledge that we have nothing of our own that is worthy of your loving kindness, and we confess that there is much in us that deserves your displeasure. In your presence, we deplore the coldness at times of our love, the feebleness of our faith, and the poverty of our service. Forgive us, we pray, O merciful Father, and suffer us not to be bound by the chains of our past transgressions. Set us free to serve you with a willing mind and an undivided heart. Leave us not, neither forsake us, O God of our salvation, for in your mercy is our hope, in your goodness our strength and stay, and in your love our perfect life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Give us trust in you, O God, for all that the days shall bring. Enable us cheerfully to perform our appointed duties and without murmuring or reluctance to do whatever your will directs. Be our strength in weakness, our light in darkness, our wisdom in uncertainty, and grant us full assurance that neither death nor life, nor things present nor things to come, be able to separate us from your love in Christ Jesus our Lord. And unto you, O Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be glory and praise for ever and ever. And we come before God now in prayer further, uniting in the words that he taught himself, our Lord himself taught us to say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and give us our trespasses, as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. <coughs> well, we turn now to hear from God's word, and I invite you to follow our Old Testament lesson as I read. Uh, you'll find it on the white insert in your order of service. And it comes from the second uh, book of Samuel, chapter 7. But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, "'Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord,' Would you build me a house to dwell in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day, but I have been moving about in a tent for my dwelling. In all places where I have moved with all the people of Israel, did I speak a word with any of the judges of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now, therefore, thus you will say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you should be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went, and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. <clears throat> but I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more as formerly. From the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your, up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, 
and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. In accordance with all these words, in accordance with all this vision, Nathan spoke to David. Well, may God add his blessing to that first reading from his holy word, and to his name be the praise and the glory. Well, we come before God now again in praise, and we sing, How I Love to Trust in Jesus. <laughs> come now to our further readings from the Bible and I invite you to uh, read the responsive passages in each of these sections. From Luke chapter 1, in the sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David and the virgin's name was Mary. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favour with God. And behold, 
you will see in your food and the very son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And from the first letter to Peter, chapter 2, so put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. And you come with him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves are living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. The is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and the stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you have not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Well, my God bless those further readings from his holy word. To his name uh, be the praise and glory. Amen. Okay, looking at the Old Testament reading in our children's talk today. Just read the first part of it. The Lord came to Nathan, the prophet. Go and tell my servant David, Thus says the Lord, would you build me a house to dwell in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought the people of Israel from Egypt to this day, but I have been moving about in a tent for my dwelling. In all places where I have moved with all the people of Israel, did I speak a word with any of the judges of Israel, whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? So, here's King David, and he is saying he's got a palace in Jerusalem, but God is still, the worship of God is still being held at tents. So, let's have a look here. So, we've got a picture here of the travelling tent that was called the tabernacle. Let's have a look a bit more closely at that. So the people of the children of Israel were set free from slavery in Egypt and they went on a long journey for the promised land. And does anyone know how God appeared to them as they were travelling along? It was different by day and by night. Toby? A cloud. There was a cloud in the daytime that they were following. What was at night, Simon? Do you know? Fire. They could see it in the dark. That's as they were travelling along. 
And God told Moses that he should build a tabernacle. All of the people were told to bring everything that they could contribute to make this amazing tabernacle where God was going to give them some very specific signs. He was going to communicate with them. They were going to learn a lot about him through this special tent. And it was a tent so they could set it up and as they moved towards the promised land, they could pack it away and carry it along with them very carefully. But the Israelites brought all of their precious things to contribute to making this very special building. So there's another there's a slightly bigger picture there. So it had um, cloth, animal skins and cloth uh, covering over it. It had embroidery and it had gold and brass and wooden furniture that they used for the, the ceremonies that were con conducted there. So right in front, this is a big altar. So what did we need an altar for, George? What do you do with an altar? You, that's wood and fire and they would <coughs> sacrifice above, you know? An animal to represent something. Okay. We'll have a, we'll have a bit more of a look at some of the, the symbolism that was used in the tabernacle. So they had this here. What's that? Yeah. Candlestick. And we know that we can look at that in the place where they worship God, communicated with God, and say that it points to something and someone. So there's a verse in the Bible that says, Your word is a light to my path, a light to my feet, and a lamp to my path. What's it talking about? The light is God's. God's Toby God. Your word is a light to my feet and a lamp to my path. God's word. Bible. Right? We now have the Holy Bible, which is a light to us. But it also represents a person. There's someone who said, I am the light of the world. Who was it? Uh, who was it? Yes, Jesus, that's right. You don't have to whisper. Okay. We've got a special gold-covered table with showbread on it. It was also in the tabernacle. Who was it said, I am the bread of life? Jesus, right. So we've got a lot of pointers in the 
furniture and the operation of the tabernacle that are pointing forward to Jesus. So inside, inside the tent at one end was a special place, the holy place, and it contained the Ark of the Covenant. So the altar and the Ark of the Covenant, which had what was called the mercy seat on top, works together once a year, a special priest would take blood from the altar where they'd sacrificed animals and would put it on the mercy seat here to represent God's cleansing of the sins of the Israelites. So, but these, these pictures here, we've got the ta tabernacle, we've got this temple. So the prophet Nathan told King David, no, you're not going to build the temple, but your son Solomon is going to build it, the temple, where they conducted sacrifices just the way they did in the tabernacle. But now when we come together as a congregation, we don't have sacrifices on a big altar. We don't have a lot of special furniture like this. They would like the like the table with the bread or the big candlestick or even they had another altar, an altar for incense, but we're still meeting in a building. So does God live in these buildings? No, very good, Simon. The point of the buildings wasn't building a house for God because God so big and so amazing. He can't fit in a house. He doesn't belong in a house. But these buildings were set up to demonstrate to us what the Israelites were looking forward to when they wouldn't have to sacrifice an animal for their sins because the light of the world was coming, the bread of life was coming. Jesus was coming to do away with all of those things. They didn't have to have a special priest. They didn't have to... Make a, make a fire, make a, an incense offering. They didn't have to send a special priest to the mercy seat to communicate with God because Jesus was coming to pay for our sins. And he was going to allow us to come before him, to communicate with him, to pray to him. And now here... In church, we are all able to be part of his family. And that's from the epistle reading. So, as you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifice acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Through Jesus' death, God can dwell with us. So we have to remember when, well, we haven't talked about the tabernacle for a long time, clearly, but um, the tabernacle, the, the temple, and even churches this isn't where God lives. God lives in us. We are 
where God lives. And when we come together, it's a very special time where, where we can meet together with God. Right, let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for the symbols that you put in the tabernacle and the temple. And thank you for Jesus who tore the curtain in the temple and made it possible for us to communicate directly with you, Lord. We thank you for Jesus' sacrifice that forgives our sins. Pray for the Holy Spirit to lead us to repent, to turn around, to change our lives, to live for you. Pray that you'll remind us as we read about these things in your word. So many things pointed forward to Jesus and now we can live with you in us. In Jesus' name. Amen. And that, of course, was a very important reminder that we must know the Old and the New Testament. And the Old Testament is important, as is the New Testament. Never, never say, as some people do, that we don't need the Old Testament. We only need the New. God has given us the Bible, which consists of the Old and New Testament. We saw there how the Old Testament helps us to see what Jesus, who Jesus was and what he came to do. Right, well, we continue in Hebrews, and could I just say that this was perhaps one of the most difficult sermons to prepare, to get it down to a level that I hope and pray that you will understand and be blessed by and be challenged by to see who Jesus really is. And we're looking at Hebrews 1, 4 to 6. Let's open our waters of service in the middle. And the section we are dealing with is in red, underneath the sermon, Christ above all others, and let's read it together. Having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. When an architect is asked to design a building, he begins with a sketch. He might just use a pencil and piece of paper, do a sketch and, and say to the people who are requiring a building or a house, is this what you would like me to plan and to draw so that they, the builders will be able to build it? Well, here in, the, here in Hebrews, the author of the book of Hebrews has sketched out in six glorious descriptions of who Christ is, and we dealt with those six descriptions over the past two sermons. And now having sketched out who Christ is in those glorious descriptions over three verses, he now begins, the author of Hebrews begins to fill in the details. In his book of Hebrews, in, the author returns again and again to the glorious attributes and saving ministry of Christ, who Christ is and what he has done. The first theme of which he fills in the details is that Christ is the Son of God, that he is one with and equal to God. Now, you may have been wondering why angels are mentioned in verse 4, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Now, of course, the one who the author of Hebrews is referring to, the one who is superior to the angels, is the very one that he has introduced to us in those six glorious ways, Jesus Christ. 
Jesus Christ is more, is far greater and superior than angels or anyone else. But why are angels specifically mentioned here? Well, the reason was that the Jews, the Hebrews, the small group of persecuted Christians in that church that he was writing to were much too preoccupied with angels. They believed that these mighty and mysterious beings exercised an unseen influence in the affairs of people. We innocent, innocent, innocently say that we have a guardian angel, do we? Could be, but never ever concentrate on the angel, for it is God who guards and keeps us. We must never become obsessed with the subject of angels. And I remember something like probably 10, 12 years ago, uh, this obsession with angels was really starting to take hold. Um, representatives from Christian book companies were coming around and uh, they were offering things about angels, statues about angels, and it also began to take hold in the Christian church. Praise God, that is now gone. And uh, angelology, hopefully, is a thing of the past. But whenever you become obsessed with subjects, whether it be angels or anything else, it takes away the authority and the power of God. And this will only lead to dangerous confusions, making angels or whatever it is equal to Christ or even superior to Christ. Is Christ God, who has always been and always will be, or is he just a created being as the angels are? Even today, there are those who say that Christ is superior to other beings, but nevertheless inferior to or less than God. Such opinions um, live on today among the Jehovah's Witness. They do not believe that Jesus is God. It lives among the Mormons. They don't believe that Jesus is God. It lives among the Islamic religion. They call Jesus a prophet, but they certainly deny that he is God. And as I've already mentioned, it sometimes lives and could still be in some churches today uh, alive in the Christian church. Now, there is a branch of the church which is called the Unitarian Church. I do not believe that it should be called a church. A Unitarian sect would be more um, correct. And they do not believe in the Trinity and say that Jesus is not God. Now, if you do not believe in the Trinity, you can't be a Christian. Let me repeat that. If you do not believe in the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, all one, equal to, with each other as God, then you cannot be a Christian. And so Hebrews sets out to demolish such thinking. It warns people that if you make Jesus less than God, then you cannot be saved. You cannot be a Christian. The angels are servants, true. But Christ is the only begotten Son, John 1.18. Christ is one with and equal to the Father. And so the author of Hebrews now goes on to fill in the details after having given us a thumbnail sketch of who Jesus is. Well, to begin with, he says in verse 4 um, that Jesus is a more excellent name, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Having become does not mean um, Christ's superiority is of a recent origin. The writer of Hebrews is definitely not saying that somehow Christ has now evolved 
into the being, the person that he is. It's not some kind of promotion that Jesus has earned through his obedience to God. Christ has been God's son and Christ and God's heir from all eternity. For as we read in John 1 verse 2, he was in the beginning with God. That is, Christ occupies the place of preeminence and always has done because he alone is the Father's Son. He alone is one with and equal to God the Father. In verse 2, we learn um, that Christ is the sole heir of his Father's wealth and glory. But more than that, verse 4 tells us that he has inherited a name or title which proclaims his unique status. And what is that name? It is the more excellent name of son. Not angel, not a mere prophet as the Muslims class him. Traditionally, a man's heir was his oldest son. All his wealth passed to this one special person, no matter, no matter how many other children um, he might have had. Even today, we know that in monarchies, it is the oldest child of a king or queen who inherits the crown, the throne, and the title of majesty. And so the writer draws an, an, an analogy. Christ inherits the throne and majesty of God because he is the son. He inherits all things together with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. He rules over all. Jesus shares that throne and title with his father. He does so uniquely because unlike most glorious of created beings, he alone has been begotten by the father. And we've got to look at that word begotten in the next point because it's very, very important. But just dealing with Christ being a more excellent name, we see that it is a grave offence against the majesty <coughs> it is a grave offence of god uh, a great offence against the majesty of god to diminish the status of his son to say that jesus is not one with and equal to god and yet this is what the small of small group of persecuted Christian Hebrews, to whom Hebrews is being written, that they were in danger of doing. And it's the same today. Those who deny the deity of Christ are the chief offenders, of course. But even as Trinitarians, as we are, we can neglect to honour the Son. We do so if, he, if we deny that he is authority over all flesh, acting in absolute sovereignty when he bestows the gifts of eternal life. We do so if we embrace materialistic theories of origins, if we deny that um, God was able to create the world in six days and ignore his creative power and providential care that God, even today, through his Son, as we heard, continues to guard and keep and provide for our needs. We do so if we stress his unfailing love and forget that he will be the judge of all the earth. And perhaps this is the most dangerous one among Christians who will preach about God's love, God's love, God's love, and that's good. But they forget that God also judges, that God hates sin. And when they forget to call sinners to repentance, that is, in fact, diminishing the authority of Jesus and who he is. He is the compassionate saviour of sinners, but he's also the sovereign Lord who will yet return to judge the living and those who have already died you worship Christ as one with and equal to God or are you in some way diminishing his authority and status?
Secondly, the author of Hebrew here teaches us that Christ is the unique person, the only begotten Son, verse 5. Now, the writer's not content to state facts about Christ. He's anxious to prove from Scripture, and he's going to prove it from the Old Testament, to prove his claims, who Jesus is. The superiority of Christ to angel is then confirmed by a sequence of seven, seven quotations from the Old Testament Scripture, which clearly show that Christ is God, one with and equal to the Father. He is not some lesser being like the angels. The author first cites or quotes Psalm 2, verse 7, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Now, after he had said that, the author of Hebrews then asked the question, to which of the angels did God ever say that you are my son? Clearly, of course, expecting, to, expecting the answer to be no, never, no, not once. It was to Christ that these words in Psalm 2.7 were addressed and referred to. The term son of God is used variously in Scripture to describe both men and angels. For example, in Hebrews 2.10 we read, for it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, that is Jesus Christ, in bringing many sons to glory, and here sons does not refer to Jesus but to God's chosen people, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. What is utterly different about Jesus is that he is the only begotten son, John 1.14. So this word begotten is very, very important. Now, I don't know about you, but I always found this word begotten rather puzzling. My immediate thought was, if Jesus has always been, if he is eternal, if he is one with and equal to God, how can he then be a created being? How can he be begotten? How can he come into being after God? Now, I hope if you've been thinking that way too, I hope that you see what you and I have done. We have translated the word begotten as created. Okay? And as many still do today, and say that Jesus is one with the Father and deny that he is God. Foolishly, I forgot to I forgot John 1 2 that before creation, Christ the Word was in the beginning with God. So if Jesus was right from the start with God, how then could I translate begotten as created? Christ is eternal, so begotten cannot mean create. And nor does it mean that Christ came into existence after the Father. As the Nicene Creed puts it, he is begotten, not made, not created, being of one substance with the Father. Okay, well, then what is the real meaning of begotten? We find the true meaning of begotten in Paul's letter to the Colossians and also in the book of Revelation. Paul calls Christ the head of the church, the first begotten from the dead. The first begotten from the dead. Colossians 1.18. Always remember Colossians 1.18. That is... Christ was the forerunner for every believer since all believers will be raised from death to glory when Christ returns. Now, similarly in Revelation 1.5, he is the firstborn from the dead. So the word begotten, the begetting, the bringing forth, didn't take place in eternity. It didn't take place before Christ um, came into the world as a man, it has nothing to do whatsoever with what happened before the creation of the universe. This begotten, this begetting took place 
when Jesus was here on earth. It happened, in fact, at his resurrection, when God begot or brought forth his son out of death and raised him alive on the third day after his crucifixion. Now, I hope you've understood that. Begotten has nothing to do with what happened before creation. It only has to do with what happened to Christ here, while here on this earth, when he was raised, when God begot or brought forth his son out of death and raised him alive on the third day after his crucifixion. That Christ, the begotten of the Father, has further implications. John tells us, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father has declared him. Because Christ is the essence of God, he is able to declare or to reveal the Father. He who has seen Christ has of necessity seen the Father, for they are one. And as I've said before, no one, no one can say that they've never seen God. All they have to do is turn to the Bible to read about Christ, and there they see God. He who has seen Christ has seen the Father, for they are one, John 14, verse 9. Scriptural revelation concerning God has been given through the prophets, but only in Christ can a person know God, since only Christ is his expressed or exact image. It stands to reason, then, if we do not see Jesus as true God, then we do not and cannot know the only true God there is. And so when people, uh, uh, you know, change God's law, introducing whether it be abortion or same-sex marriage or, uh, or change gender rubbish, um, they don't know Christ. Because if they knew Christ, they would know God. And if they knew God, then, of course, they would want to obey his word, not become gods themselves and say, this is how it should be, rather than obeying God's way. We cannot be saved. We will never have peace and joy of our sins being forgiven and the assurance of eternal life if we do not recognise who Christ is, because Christ is the express image of God the Father. God has fulfilled his ancient promise, as stated in Psalm 2.7. You are my son, today I have begotten you. I have brought Jesus forth out of death, death I have raised him to eternal life, so that all who believe on Jesus are raised up with him also into eternal life. It marks the completion and the acceptance of his redeeming work here that he came to do in, in his lifetime on earth. Because God has begotten his only son out of death into life, all who put their trust in Jesus are not only forgiven, but they have the glorious and wonderful promise and assurance, the guarantee of being raised up with Jesus into his eternal kingdom, to eternal glory. His sonship is now our sonship. His inheritance is now our inheritance. His exaltation into glory is now our exaltation. All who truly believe on the Lord Jesus Christ are received into everlasting glory. While Jesus is God's only natural son, but because God the Father has begotten him, raised him or brought him forth out of death, we who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ are adopted as sons and daughters of his into his eternal kingdom. And that adoption can only take place because God has begotten his son brought him forth out of death, and we therefore can become his adopted sons and daughters with the glorious and wonderful promise of eternal life. Friends, do you have that promise? Do you believe? Do you have the assurance right now that you will be with the Saviour in glory when you die? You can have it. It's guaranteed here. 
because Jesus is God's begotten Son. God can also, and God will beget all who believe in Jesus into, out of death, into eternal life. That's a glorious promise that brings peace and joy to people today. Why do people not have that peace and joy? Why do we so see so many people turn to drugs, to this and to that, and end up um, all wound up and in hospital because they do not believe on the Lord Jesus, and therefore they do not have that guarantee of eternal life, that peace and joy which is only comes through God, God's Son, Jesus. The writer then presses his case with a quote from 2 Samuel 7.14, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Now, historically, these words were spoken by God through the prophet Nathan concerning King Solomon. His father David, King David, had desired to build a house for the Ark of the Covenant, but God would not allow him to do so, as we heard in the children's address. The privilege of building that temple, not the mobile tent, but the permanent temple was granted to his son Solomon. God's promise was that he would be a father to the son who was to succeed David and that his son would be a son to him. And that was a promise of a special blessing, which, of course, had its immediate fulfilment in the magnificent reign of David's son Solomon, under whom the temple in Jerusalem was constructed. But both as a person and as a king, Solomon was far from perfect and sinful man that he was, by the very nature of things, what was promised here could not possibly apply to Solomon. His kingdom didn't last forever. You'll remember that it was broken up and eventually, of course, um, there, there were no um, uh, tribes left. Indeed, the corruption and sinfulness of the last days of Solomon's reign and the subsequent overthrow, overthrow of the kingdom of Judah and destruction of the Jerusalem temple indicate clearly enough that the fulfilment of the promise in its ultimate sense was not fulfilled in Solomon's time. It was a prophecy, as we again heard in the children's address, concerning someone else. And so the writer of the Hebrews takes up this story and quite rightly applies that prophecy into Samuel to Christ, great David's greatest son. Solomon built a temple in, of stone, but Christ, as we heard in Peter, is building one of the living stones, that is, his church. Peter writes, you also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Peter in his second letter also states that it is Christ's kingdom which is everlasting. And so we see the prophecy in Samuel referring to Jesus, whose kingdom is everlasting. For this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. But apart from the way Solomon pictures Christ, the text makes a plain statement concerning the relationship of Jesus to God. Under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, the writer applies the scripture to show that Jesus is uniquely the Son of God who perfectly obeyed his Father. Again, he asks the question, did God ever address an angel as being his son? And of course, the implied response is no, no, never. Our author is saying then that this ancient promise finds its fulfilment in the coming of Jesus, who is both son of God and son of David, because he was of the family line of Judah. Truly God, and through coming to this earth, through his incarnation, being born as a man, truly man, and that never was any such promise made with reference to to an angel. And so we see that Christ's sonship is unique. 
Oh, yes, God has other sons and daughters, but we are his children, not only because God the Father adopts us into his family through Jesus, whom he brought forth from the dead, dead, but also because of Jesus' perfect obedience here on earth. I will be to him a father, and he will be to me a son. Jesus could only be a son to his father if he were without sin. Because of all that Jesus did for his people, his suffering and death and rising again, because of his perfect obedience, God's sons and daughters, those who believe in him, they are made righteous. They are made as if they had never sinned. So when they stand before God the Father on Judgment Day, the clothes, the sins, the dirty clothes of sins will no longer be seen. Only the righteous cloak, the white, clean cloak of Christ's cleansing, his righteousness, that is what God will see, and he, we will be welcomed into his everlasting kingdom. And so, once again, we see the uniqueness of Christ and how important that is for our salvation. For if Christ were not one with and equal to God, we would not be saved. We could not have the assurance of eternal life. We could never have that peace and joy which Christ alone can give. I've only gone through half the sermon, but we'll have to leave it there. And I, I, I hope that you really come to see who Christ is and what he has done for you, that you might take hold of Jesus and that you might truly love him and serve him Give your all to him. Angels cannot do that. Money cannot do that. Power cannot do that. The cults cannot do that. Only Jesus can. When we do respond to all who Jesus is and what he has done for us, how can we not give him our all? How can we not give him our all? How can we not serve him day by day? How can we not share his love with others. May God truly grant to us that proper understanding and may it warm our hearts and minds of who Jesus really is. Let us pray. Oh, Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for the author of Hebrews reminding us and stressing and, and showing to us from the Old Testament who Jesus is and what he came to do. He is the unique son. He is the only begotten son, the firstborn, the one raised from the dead, brought forth out of death into life by you, his heavenly father and our heavenly father. And we thank you that because Christ has been begotten, we too can be begotten because believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, we too are brought forth out of death into life eternal life, inheriting that glorious eternal kingdom which has no end. Oh, Father, I pray for any here this morning who do not know Jesus, who, who, who do not know his love and what he has done for them, of who he is, that the Holy Spirit would truly open their eyes and that they would respond to his love in loving and willing obedience that we would give our all following Jesus every step of our way, that we would reflect him and show to others who he is in all that we say, do, and think. Oh, Father, just help us in Jesus' name. Amen. the call of the kingdom and uh, you'll be given the opportunity to give your all or to show what it means to give your all as we wait upon you for your tithes and free will offering. <laughs>
Chasa, we sung those words that we really meant them and that you're asking God to really apply them to your hearts. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for all your blessings. We thank you that you are the Lord who sovereignly rules over all. We thank you that all that we have has come from you. And, Father, we praise you for the great God that you have, for your mercy and for the abundant blessings which come to us day by day. Father, how can we repay you? Father, we can only do so by truly loving you, loving you with the whole of our being and using all that you've entrusted to us for your glory and for your honour and for the extension of your kingdom. And so we pray that you'll receive these, our gifts, and with them ourselves, that you'll grow our love for you because as our love grows, so will our giving. Oh, Lord, our God, we just pray your blessing upon us upon your church here. We are small, but we know, Father, that even through smallness you can do great things. And we pray that you'll do great things through us, that we will be prepared to give ourselves to you. And as we give ourselves to you, you will use us, and, and through us you will grow your kingdom. May we firstly, though, grow spiritually, learning to love you more, learning to commit our ways unto you, learning to give everything that we have to you. We pray for our nation. We pray, Father, that the church, in the churches in our nations will truly proclaim the truth of your word, calling people to repentance and urging people to truly love you, reminding them that uh, you are all powerful, that with you there's nothing to fear and that we can go safely into the future because you are the future. We pray, Father, that you'll graciously lift um, this pandemic, this judgment of yours upon our nation, upon the world, that through the people come to see that you are God, that you are the one who controls all things and that we are to love and to follow and to obey you and not to set, our, set up ourselves as gods. We pray for governments. We pray, Father, for those who, who set themselves up as gods and that they want to rule the world their way. They want to rule the people their way rather than turning to you, the way of righteousness and truth. Father, we pray for our families. We pray, Lord, for those who are not well, that your healing hand will be upon them. We pray, Father, uh, for William Joseph, that you will continue to strengthen him and bring healing into his body. We, we pray for um, Arad's family who have shifted. We ask, Lord, that you'll help them to shift in quickly and that they'll be able to uh, make this a, a home. And, Lord, that you will show them what to do, whether to come back and that you will provide a house for them in that case. Oh, Lord, our God, we, we, we pray for our young people. We thank you for those who came on Friday night, but we don't see them here this morning. Some, yes, and we praise God for them. We pray for the mothers here. We ask, Lord, that you will help them to encourage them and to bring them along tonight, that they will be challenged from your word. We pray all who have made vows to commit themselves to you, that they will remember those vows and that in your strength they will be able to keep those vows. We pray, Father, for those who are stumbling along in darkness because of things that have happened in their lives. We pray that you, Jesus, the light of the world, will truly shine upon them and give them hope and encouragement and strength that they may turn to you and worship you and be able to serve you, to grow in love. Father, we pray for our children also. We ask that here too your grace will be evident, and that they will be able to look to us to see what it really means to be a Christian and to walk in your way. Father, we pray for those who are prisoners of fear because of what is happening. May, the, may your grace release them from that fear and that they will again be able to truly worship you and, and go about freely, knowing that you love and that you care for them. So, Lord, just undertake for us 
as we come to Australia Day, we do pray for our nation. We just pray, Father, that um, you'll work in the hearts and lives of those um, in authority, our parliamentarians, um, our lawmakers, our police. Thank you for those who are working so hard in the um, hospital systems and we pray that you'll keep them safe. And uh, we just ask, Lord, that you'll guide and lead and undertake that this country will again be a country, the great Southland of the Holy Spirit. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand for the benediction and we'll sing the last two verses of Crown Him the Lord of Peace. Let's stand. Now my mercy, grace and peace from Father, Son and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you both now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs> Thank you.